Okay, so welcome everyone to our Data and Decision Science Network meeting. Uh, today we're having a presentation on teaching program and modelling to first year undergraduates, tips and lessons learned. But just before I formally introduce Jenny, just a quick bit of background as to why we're doing these meetings. So the Data and Decision Science Network is part of the Data and Decision Science Initiative, which is part of our strategic plan. And just a definition there of data science is how we see it here at UOW. So just to talk about the initiative, there are four components. So the first area of focus that we have is on research. And I've underlined there where these meetings fit into that research capacity. So this is really the aim of the network is to try and bring together researchers and students in UOW who are interested in data and decision science and talk about various themes of interest. So if there are any suggestions at the end about other topics that people would like to discuss, or if anyone wants to volunteer to present, that would also be fantastic. We also have a really strong focus on education. So that's both internal and external training in data science, and also looking at our undergraduate subjects, which is part of what Jenny will be talking about today, and how we can make those more data science focused and then also internal and external engagement and promoting UOW's capacity in data science. So it's now my pleasure to introduce Associate Professor Jenny Fisher. Jenny is an Associate Professor in the Centre for Atmospheric Chemistry in the School of Earth, Atmospheric and Life Sciences. And she's also the Associate Dean of Equity, Diversity and Inclusion for the Faculty of Science, Medicine and Health. Jenny's research centers on investigating the sources, chemical evolution and transport pathways of atmospheric pollution using numerical methods. So thanks Jenny for agreeing to talk to us today and I'll let you share the, your slides now, thanks. Great, thanks Marika for that introduction. Uh, I'm just gonna share a slide now. Can you just let me know if that looks okay on your end? Yes, yep. that's great. Excellent. Um, yeah, well, thank you for the, the invitation, Marika, to come talk to the group today. Um, as Marika said, I'm an atmospheric scientist. My, my research is largely in atmospheric modeling using large global scale models um, and also you know, dealing with, with a number of different types of data in um, a number of different ways. Um, but what I'm talking about today is really the work that we've done in the earth and environmental sciences to kind of bring some of these concepts into our curriculum. So I'm going to talk a little bit about what we did and how we did it and the choices we made along the way. Um, a little bit about some of the outcomes of that and then uh, a little bit about kind of some tips or lessons learned for anyone who wants to try to bring some of this into their own undergraduate teaching. I'm super happy for this to be, you know, a, a informal. If you have questions, pop them in the chat. Um, either we can grab them as we go or, or do some questions at the end. And I do have one part that's a bit interactive, so I will ask for some audience participation briefly. Um, okay, so I want to start with the why and the how, and I guess a little bit of the what <laughs> that we did. And we have to cast our minds back to um, about 2015 that we were starting this work. So kind of a slightly different environment at the university. Um, I think this was before the data and decision science was part of the strategy. Um, but we were in the earth and environmental sciences in the middle of a curriculum review. I was a new academic, there were a couple of us. And we were trying to redesign our curriculum from the starting from the first year, but thinking about what did we want our graduates to be able to do at the end of a degree in geology or geography or environmental science and sort of what skills did we need them to have and we were pretty well covered on some of the traditional skills like uh you know the field skills and the lab skills and writing and some of the sort of uh, i guess basic data skills but what we really realized we were missing was the, the computing and programming skills and yeah, you know, these are necessary in all the sciences. I think we recognize this now. Um, but at the time we were talking about the value of large data sets in these fields, dealing with visualizations, um, numerical models, which was my area of interest, the, the complex statistics and lots of other things that I'm sure that people in this room would recognize the, the value of. And we weren't alone in not teaching these in our degrees. It was pretty rare for any traditional geoscience curricula to include these skills. 
And so we decided, well, we're going to change this. Um, it, it wasn't necessarily an easy thing to approach. Uh, now, many of the earth science students that we have tend to have a strong math phobia. Um, my favorite quote is a student telling me, I don't math. <laughs> and um, that was fairly common. You know, people people felt uncomfortable with with lots of like the high school math that they'd done coming in. And in some cases, you know, choose their sciences because they love science, but they want to avoid having too much math. So that was one challenge we were facing. Um, in looking at kind of what, you know, what students could enroll in if they went kind of a traditional programming or computing route, there's a pretty steep learning curve. And, you know, even trying to deal with what is a terminal and how do I enter this code? And again, we're, you know, we're going back a few years here. Um, there's just a lot to learn before you can actually start learning the concepts. We had a pretty full curriculum as it was, and we didn't really have space for there to be like a brand new subject explicitly on this. And also from what we kind of had heard elsewhere, students really often struggle to see the relevance, at least they did at the time, it might be changing, but the, you know, an earth science student who really loves being out in the field, struggled to see the relevance sometimes of why would I have to learn, you know, have a whole class on, on computing or on programming. So our solution was to just embed these in one of our existing core subjects with the idea that we would try to link the skills that they were learning in that subject to the content matter of the subject. And in some parts of the subject that was easier to do and in some parts it was harder. Um, but we wanted to make sure that we were sort of at least as much as we could bringing in relevance from the beginning um, and so we did this in a subject that's now called Earth's Interconnected Spheres. Um, it's basically an introduction to Earth system science. And it's a spring session subject. So most of our students, it's first year spring session. So most of our students are in their second session at uni. Um, we brought it in in 2016. We kind of redeveloped the whole subject at the time. And for the first three years, it was core for our Earth and environmental science majors. So that was about 100 to 120, maybe up to 150 students. Um, since 2020, it's been core for all the natural science BSc majors in SMA. So that includes chemistry and molecular biology. Uh, and that, and we're now up to about 200 to 250 students a year. So it's a, it's a fairly large subject, at least from what we're used to teaching in, in that part of the sciences. Um, and it's core, so we have no mathematics prerequisites and no assumed prior programming experience. And this all affects some of the things I'll talk about in a few minutes about how we actually did this, um, but keeping all of these things in mind. So we needed to make a couple of key decisions in this process. So I'm just, I'm gonna outline uh, two of them. The first was the question of which language do we teach? And as I imagine the discussion would probably be for many of the people in this room, it, it kind of ended up boiling down to, um, do we want R or Python? Because those were two languages that are in use in our fields. And at least at the time, um, we we decided to go with Python. And I mean, the decisions here are largely true of R as well. Um, but some of the things that influenced this thinking were that it was you know, free, it was easy to install. Um, it was widely used in the geosciences, but also in industry. So we were looking at kind of the employability side of things. Um, from scoping what other universities had been doing at the time, it seemed like a lot were turning to Python for these introductory classes. And from our perspective, it seemed like the syntax was just that little bit easier to learn. It was a little bit more natural. Um, I don't know how things have changed in that time necessarily for R because I'm not really an R user. So that also helped. I was more comfortable with Python, but both were actually pretty new to me at the time. I was using other things for my research. So I had to learn a little bit alongside the students. Um, one thing that was useful is that in the geosciences, we teach GIS uh, and all of our students were having a GIS subject. And as we thought about how we might scaffold these things up into the curriculum, Python had capabilities to integrate with GIS and we thought that could be quite powerful for our students. So that was another, um, another rationale. And it could be used in this friendly Jupyter notebook interface um, that many of you might be familiar with, but if not, I'm gonna show in a minute anyway. Um, now I'll, I'll highlight that many of our second and third year subjects still use R. So we didn't make a decision that, you know, we were gonna go whole hog in one direction. This was what we decided to do as our starting point for the students. And then we kind of have had the philosophy that, you know, once the students have learned one language in a dedicated way, they can learn another. And 
you know, as I think probably many people who do this kind of work and are in the room will know, the more that you, the more of these languages you learn, the better you understand all of them, really, the easier it becomes to learn the next one. So actually, I think this is kind of a nice design feature, um, having subjects that work in different languages. I think it provides a real practical skill for the students when they have to take that base level knowledge and then apply it to something different in a different subject. Um, so although it wasn't initially our intention to kind of do this mixed um, mixed degree, uh, it's where we've ended up. And I actually think it's, it's not a bad thing at all. Um, okay, so the second key decision was what do we actually need students to learn in the subject? What are kind of our key learning goals? And this is where I want to open it up to the audience and um, get a couple of your thoughts, either in the chat or just, you know, turn on your mics and say, you know, what do you think students taking a sort of integrated programming class like this need to learn? Can I add a little tidbit here? If you can hear me. Yep. Um, I think this is really funny because I completed my first year BSC in 2013 and I found it funny that I was like, oh, this would have been so useful. And I'm like, damn, just a year out. <laughs> Thanks, Sarah. We've got how to read code, how to install Python. Any other thoughts, what you would want a student to know at the end of a subject like this? Or what you would have wanted to know, Sarah, if this had been in your um, your degree? Uh, at least from an R standpoint, I always find that loading in your data is one of the big trickies for people first learning it. So being able to load in your data and get those basic statistics or whatever basic analysis would be a, a primary objective how to load in data that's an interesting one i want to come back to that later um if i don't remember during the talk bring it up in the the questions at the end anyone else Jenny, I wonder okay. if I could add more context to my how to read code. Sure. Um, because I'm conscious that students can access code online really easily and they copy and paste all the time without checking it. And that's really, I want them to be able to read it and know what, what the code's doing, that not essentially be able to write it, but to understand what the code is that they're looking at. Great. Thanks, Carly. Uh, so we're going to say to interpret both ways, right? Translate problem to code, code to output, output to real life. Excellent. Thanks, Alberto. All right, great. Well, this is great. Oh, and how it's relevant to many industries and jobs. Yeah, so this this is great. And I wasn't sure where the room would go if it would be kind of focused on specific skills or more kind of big picture stuff. And I, I love the direction that it's gone because that's really aligned with kind of the thinking that, that we had here. So, you know, our key, I said my, but really this was a team effort. Our key goals for students are quite big picture so they're you know not seeing the computer or we also touch on modeling which i'll get to in a minute but not seeing the stuff as just a black box and you know we hear a lot about how this generation is like the tech generation and the digital generation but actually what we see is that you know they can use the tools but they really uh often don't have an insight into what's going on behind them and i think even less than you know some of us who kind of <laughs> grew up through the the you know advent of the internet and computers and things weren't quite as easy as they are now. So we wanted to get rid of that kind of black box thinking. Um, this one didn't really come up, but it's, and I suppose this is something that's happened as we've gone through and seen how this has actually played out, but getting students in the first year doing something hard, something that they find challenging and, you know, the kind of tech terminology of failing forward. So having things that don't work and figuring out how to pick themselves up and keep going from them. And I'll come back to that later too. Um, I think we touched on this one a little bit, like thinking and working in that structured logical way. So being able to take a problem and kind of break it down into component parts and steps. Um, and then this one really comes back to what Carolee was saying. So understanding the principles of code so they can read something, they can understand at least at a baseline level what's going on and have a thoughtful conversation about it. Um, and yeah, and then also thinking, you know, this is sort of our big picture one, but thinking about what comes out, how it relates to what they already understand. So being able to make that relationship between just this is what the computer says and this is what I know to be true. Um, and then, you know, how what role a computer or a model can play 
as they're trying to address these more complex problems that, you know, they will see in their careers in science or industry. And that comes back a little bit into, you know, how these things are relevant for the, the vast array of things that they might go into. And I think the key point here is that none of this was really about, you know, doing something the right way or knowing a specific tool. And even, you know, even being able to write code isn't really on here. Now, obviously they do a lot of that, but at the end of the day, we're quite satisfied if they come away with these big picture understandings, even if they don't feel confident enough to then go and go into their next subject and say, right, instead of using Excel, I'm just gonna do this in, in Python. We don't quite get them to that level of comfort within one semester. Um, but we try to get them to understand some of these big picture issues. But they do write a lot of code in the process. And some of them actually do come back and say, oh, we had this Excel problem in my physics class. And instead of using Excel, I just wrote a Python program. And that's always that's always exciting to hear. Um, OK, so that then brings me to our implementation. So uh, and I will say that a lot of this a lot of the kind of starting point that we got came from a subject that existed at Imperial College in the UK. They had a programming for geoscientists course. It was in some ways quite different because it was a standalone course that was at a university that required a lot of mathematical background to get into these science courses. Um, but they had some examples that were useful and they had also used the Jupyter Notebook framework for this. And I, I would assume many people here are familiar with Jupyter Notebooks, but um, any for anyone who isn't, this is just a little bit of an example of what they look like. And I'll, I'll play the video in a second. So. One of the nice things from the perspective of students who aren't really comfortable with this stuff and, you know, it's a kind of a big learning curve is that once you install basically one program, one app on their computer, um, this opens in a web browser. And so what they're seeing is a kind of very familiar way of interacting with a computer so that there, there's not that kind of added cognitive load of I need to write a script and I need to learn how to run that script in this other program. Uh, it's all kind of happening in this familiar space. And it allows us to put in just text and things that they read. So this is done in Markdown um, and then have code cells that they can actually execute. And I should say that these can use R as well. So if anybody is trying to teach an R, you can, you know, you can use them in R as well. Um, so if I just play this little video, you know, you can see it scrolling down um, when you get to these code cells. And this is one of our old version of one of our notebooks. You can run the cells, you get the output there. Um, and so what we did is kind of embed these examples along with, um, oh yeah, you can make plots as well. I think this one's going to show a plot coming out. And then um, you can, you know, you can load various libraries in here. And then you can also, we also then embedded exercises in the notebooks as well. Um, so those were in a different color font. So the students would see them and know kind of, okay, now it's time for me to try doing these things. We've actually now, this is kind of an old version, but we've we've now separated the exercise notebook into a separate notebook from the um, informational and example one, just so that they can put them side by side and, and really look back and forth as they're trying to do these things themselves. And of course, we tried to make sure that all of our examples were somewhat linked to the course content that we were doing in the lectures at the same time, which had nothing to do with Python. That was all about how the earth system works and climate change and the atmosphere and the ocean. So. Um, I like that figure that that uh, Marika showed about what you know how we define data science because it really is bringing in these you know this subject is really bringing those computing skills alongside that domain knowledge and trying to link them up in the eyes of the students. Um, all right, so what we did then in terms of, and this is this is what we do now. I should say there's been a few iterations, as you can imagine. Some of this, uh, some things worked well the first time, some things didn't. We now have five weeks. So starting in week two, we have five weeks of pro what we call programming fundamentals. So the first week is all kind of an introduction to all of the all of the stuff. We actually have a week zero that they do on their own computers to download the program. Um, we didn't do that until COVID, I'll, I'll add. Uh, we did this all in the computer labs because we wanted to avoid that step in installation. And we were very nervous about it during remote learning. But actually, it's worked really well. And it means students can get a little bit more practice on their own um, without having to come into uni. So that, that's been pretty valuable. So we do that kind of first week of the basics. And then um, this is one thing that we changed over time after the, you know, we started looking, we started following kind of what the Imperial course did, and then we changed it in the second year we did it to bring plots in straight away into the, you know, as soon as we could, basically, after they learned how to print and write comments, we brought in plots. 
because that's really what we want the student. I mean, it's more fun, first of all. They're, you know, instead of printing things to the screen, they're actually seeing stuff come up. And what we want is the students to start to think about that interpretation piece, which is hard to do when you've just got some numbers. Uh, and so being able to then start putting in plots has, has really helped with, I think, the, you know, the culture of what we're doing in the subject. Um, from there, we brought in logic, so if statements, we brought in for loops, and we brought in functions. And all of this is quite deliberate for what we need in the second part of the subject. And we we pruned and pruned and pruned. And so we've got, I didn't show it here, um, but we've got some bits that are fun extra things that you would kind of normally learn in a progression like this, but that we decided the students didn't really know need to know. And so we put those in a different font, they're purple, they've got lots of, if you have time, if you're having fun, you know, you can do these extra bits and pieces. And that's helped us to, you know, keep the students engaged to pick this stuff up really fast, but also really pare it down for the students who struggle a bit more to have just the basic fundamentals of what they need. Um, I, yeah, I should say each week, so each week we, we do these exercises in class. Um, we had it used to be a three hour lab now it's a two hour lab with uh you know teaching staff and demonstrators there and they're as much as we can they're in pairs or in groups working through stuff although they each do the things on their own computer they work through the exercises in class submit them at the end and then after about i think the second or third year we brought in review quizzes because we found that you know just doing the things once students would come to the next um, prep, which, you know, always built on the previous one, and they wouldn't fully remember some of those things. So we have some fairly straightforward quiz questions uh, that let them get just that little bit more practice. They have to do these review quizzes, but they can do them as many times as they want. They can take as long as they want. We point them to this online resource where they can test stuff out, but they can also open, now they've got it on their computer, they can also open Jupyter Notebook. So they're not meant to be a barrier for them. They're just giving them that extra practice to kind of get ready for the next class. A lot of subjects in science do kind of a pre-lab quiz where they have some pre-lab reading and then a quiz before they come in. We decided against that because the stuff was too new and it was already a bit stressful for them. So we didn't want them to be trying to learn things on their own as much. Um, we wanted them to kind of learn in that supported environment, but then do that individual practice on their own afterwards. So after those like five weeks of what we call the fundamentals. Um, we have a natural break because it's the mid-session exam for the lecture part that, like I said, is unrelated. Um, and then we move into what tends to be a little bit more fun, which is our introduction to modeling. Uh, so we have packed a lot into this subject because we're not just doing the programming. We're also trying to get this to like the scientific um, side of things. We start with a, an introduction to the concepts of modeling, and this does cross over quite well into what we do in the lectures as well, because we talk a lot about the carbon cycle and things that require an understanding of a sort of simple box model framework. So we talk, we use a bathtub as a kind of baseline example, and we talk about flows in and flows out and the size of a reservoir changing. And then in week nine, we have a set of four different um, models that the students can choose from. All of them are related to what we're doing in the subject content, um, so in the lectures, so there's that crossover. They build on the concepts from that, that bathtub model, but they're, um, they're quite guided, really. They're sort of, you know, getting them to understand these concepts of inputs and outputs and sensitivities and rates and, and change. Um, they're in groups at this point, so they choose as a group which one they're going to work on, but they still, uh, they still each submit one of these. And I can talk more about what's actually in them if anybody's curious later. Um, and then we get to the, the really fun part of the subject. Uh, and this is so this is the last couple of weeks of the subject. Those groups take that model that they worked on together in week nine, and their task is just to adapt it to answer a new question. And it's extremely open ended. It's extremely flexible and creative. We tell them it doesn't matter if your question is realistic or completely made up. Um, it doesn't matter how hard the question is or how hard the change is. What we really want them to do is go through that process of having a question that they want to answer using this model as a tool. So they have to make some adaptation to it in order to answer it and then interpreting that result in the context of their question and thinking about what choices they had to make and what's uncertain and what the limitations are, but what kind of big picture understanding they can still get. Um, 
we're pretty lucky to do that in the science teaching facility. So we've got these big computers on wheels. Um, you know, students will often have their own laptops out as well, but they can kind of look at the code together and work on work through this together. We help them through kind of how they're sometimes how they're going to implement things because sometimes they get quite ambitious. Um, but it's it's really fun and it's been really eye opening to just see what the students come up with. And I've listed some examples here. Um, these are, I, I would say, some of the more realistic ones. We've also had some, uh, I think one of my favorite ones from a few years ago was a group that came up with two different Star Wars planets that had varying types of resources and um, varying types of technology and how their populations would fare. Um, we also have recently had a lot that are related to COVID in some way or another. So this is really bringing those skills home for them. And I, I think, um, not only is it the most fun for me, but the students really gain a huge amount at this point in the subject. Um, I didn't put it on here, but in week 13, they present those results to the class. And if we can, we try to go to like a seminar room for that and kind of make it a sort of scientific conference type process. Um, all right, so the last thing I wanna talk about in terms of the implementation that we used is how do we assess this stuff? Because that's always a challenge in, uh, you know, in these kinds of subjects. Um, so we, we start again from kind of what our key goals are and we had some key principles to think of that we thought about, I guess, as we developed the assessment and as we varied that over time. Um, we wanna make sure that they have opportunities for practice and for learning and improving before they're starting to worry about their marks. And they'll always worry about their marks, but we can at least tell them, no, 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 this part isn't marked, you know, just try it. And, you know, I find, especially with first year students coming out of the HSC environment, a lot of times, they're really scared to even try something you know you'll you'll they'll ask you for help and you'll say oh you know what what do you think the first step would be and they'll they'll tell you the right thing and you'll say well what happened when you tried that and they'll say well i didn't try it why didn't you try it well i was afraid it might be wrong well what's going to happen if it goes wrong oh yeah nothing so we're trying to kind of coach them through that process of like just try stuff and do it wrong and it's okay and we have to make sure that our assessment actually matches that philosophy so that they have time where they're doing this without getting marks um we also wanted to assess process and learning and interpretation and not focus on you know, the right answer or, or doing things the right way. So we don't have any assessment about, you know, is this efficient code or you know, did you use, we have some that say, you know, if the, the task of the exercise is to use a for loop, you need to use a for loop to do it. But other than that, if they get into the projects and you know, they could have done something more simple with a for loop, but they didn't, doesn't matter. What we want is for them to be able to apply those tools. And then we also consider this to be embedded work integrated learning. You know, we're really trying to get them to use the kind of skills they would use in a work environment. So we wanted to make it as realistic as possible and not focus on, you know, them memorizing something for an exam. Um, they do have exams for the lecture content. So we wanted to keep this part exam free. Um, so what we do, and it's a little bit complicated, um, but basically we have those weekly review quizzes that I mentioned before. They are marked, but they can do them as many times as they like. Um, they can take as long as they want. They can use whatever tools. And, you know, most students get to the, I mean, I think we ask them to get to 50% before they come to class. We suggest they get to 80% before they come to class. And most students can get to 100% or very close to it. So it's really kind of just a little mark booster for most of them to kind of take some of the pressure off. Um, they do submit their notebook every week. And we do that to help them keep on track. We, uh, we have found that if we don't ask them for something sometimes they will get really far behind and we don't want that to happen so they submit it every week but it's not marked back in the kind of pre-covid budget constrained world that we lived in we were actually able to give them feedback on those notebooks every week we don't have that kind of teaching budget anymore so we've had to adapt that um, but what we do now is introduce them to the marking rubric which i'll show in a second uh, we do that in week three. So week two, they do their first exercise. Week three, they come back in, they do a practice in class marking exercise with some examples to understand what it is we're assessing them on. And then every week we, we try to get them to self-assess um, so that they kind of are prepared for what's coming. Then when we finish all of the individual things, they submit a portfolio, which is all of their practicals. They can improve the original version. So if they want to, you know, if they're resubmitting week three and they've learned a lot in the process, they can improve that. There's no problem there. Um, and they also submit a reflection about their learning through this and how they've learned to learn. Um, 
we then mark two of those seven practicals because basically that's all we kind of have the budget <laughs> to be able to mark with a class this size. Um, we don't tell them in advance which ones they are, but we usually try to do one of the easier ones and one of the, the later harder ones. Um, and then when they go into the group projects, we mark them on the oral presentation, um, which is again, pretty straightforward. And then on an, an individual summary that they write up to demonstrate that they understand what's happened in the project to try to get away from that kind of, you know, half the group does all of the work situation. Um, in terms of the practicals themselves, uh, there's a lot here and I can send this around to anybody who wants it, but I'll just run through briefly the things that we're marking them on. So making sure that they've actually done all the things in the um, notebook, which was the thing we had to implement during COVID because we were finding they'd just skip the hard problem at the end. Um, <laughs> Uh, but then it's really about, you know, did they do what we asked them to do? So if we said, you know, print something or plot something or use a for loop for this problem, you know, just doing that, translating that problem into the action. Um, then we have a, a bunch of stuff that's really about that kind of fundamentals of, you know, understanding a, a code, but not necessarily doing it a specific way. So we spend a lot of time talking about comments and the value of comments for yourself and for someone else that you're working with. So there's a little bit about um, comments and making sure somebody else could understand it. Variables having good names and because we're in the sciences, you know, specifying what their units are and that sort of thing. Plots being on the right axes and having, you know, labels and legends and just again, being able to share these outputs with someone. And then most of the points are associated with the justification and interpretation. Um, so what we do at the end of each, uh, each practical exercise, we have a big bringing it all together question that has some thought questions at the end that link back to the content that they're learning in the lectures. And so we ask them to link the output from what they've got to their understanding. And we want them to justify how those things are related. So if, you know, if they get a plot out that shows temperature decreasing, we want them to be able to describe in words that the temperature is decreasing and why that might be based on what they know. Um, and we also want them to be able to recognize if something didn't work right or doesn't look right and to not just you know, say, well, this is what it is. So we give them full points if they say, you know, the plot shows the temperature decreasing. But I know from the lectures that actually, as you move closer to the sun, the temperature should be increasing. I don't know what's going wrong in the program, but this is what I've tried and this is what's happening. So we're really trying to, again, bring this back to process. Um, oops, didn't mean to stop sharing that. Uh, where did we go? There we go. All right. So um, that brings me to kind of the end of the implementation part. And uh, what I want to do for the rest is just run briefly through some of our, our impacts, our very preliminary data, and then some, some tips. So I think I've got a little bit of time for both of these still. Um, so, you know, there are different ways to look at the outcomes. Um, one is obviously what students think about this work, um, and that's not just from the evaluations, but also, you know, we spend a lot of time talking to them in the class. Um, so, you know, as you'd expect, students, you know, it's a pretty mixed bag. Again, it's a core class. A lot of them don't see why they should have to do this, um, especially now that it's core in all of the sciences. And it's, you know, not only are they now having to focus on earth science when what they really want to do is laboratory chemistry, but they also have to do this kind of hard programming thing. Um, so we get some extreme views. Some love it, some hate it. Um, we get what I call the secret enthusiasts. So every year I have a handful of students who come up to me in secret and they say, I know everybody doesn't really like this stuff, but I love it. And they don't want to tell their peers that, but they want to tell me. So that's that's always a bit fun. Um, some people find it really easy. Some just, you know, breeze through. Their their minds think in this way. It's, it's quite logical for them. Uh, Many find it challenging, um, but what, what I've learned over time is that they do quite impress themselves at the end with what they accomplish. And we, we try to build in a little bit of that reflection for them to kind of see where they started with and how hard they found it and kind of what they get to at the end. And I'll talk a little bit at the end about kind of some tips for guiding them through that process. Um, but we also wanted a little bit of a better assessment of how the subject might change student perceptions. Uh, if it does. So um, for the past few years, we've been running um, surveys. We did, did this through a, a faculty funded education grant um, to kind of develop this, but we found a validated survey instrument that's been published in the literature that measures student confidence, interest, and uh, usefulness. And I call it perceived usefulness. That's sort of what they think. Um, 
there are a bunch of different questions. I've put some examples here of the kind of questions that they get. So there are questions of, um, you know, I am comfortable with learning computing concepts, or I have little self-confidence when it comes to computing courses. So those are in the kind of confidence vein. Um, in the interest vein, there are questions like the challenge of solving problems using computing appeals to me, or I would not take additional computing courses if I were given the opportunity. Uh, and then in the usefulness vein, we have, um, you know, things like developing computing skills will be important to my career goals or knowledge of computing skills will not help me secure a good job. So there are a number of these questions. Um, we survey them right at the start before they do their week two practical. Actually, I think now we've even put it in the kind of stuff that they have to do when they're getting Python set up. Um, and then we also survey them, I said at the end, but we actually do it, and I think this is a, a methodological error um, in what we've decided to do. We survey them at the end of the individual stuff. So just before they go into the group projects, um, having seen the way that they develop over those group projects, I think we would get different result if we actually surveyed them at the end, but we were cognizant of the teacher and subject evaluations coming out at the end as well. And we just thought they'd be over surveyed. I, I wish that we'd done it differently, um, but uh, that's kind of the data set that we have. And um, embarrassingly, I have about four years of data, but I've only ever gotten to work up one set of it. So what I'm gonna show is super preliminary because it's just one, one year of data and things have changed a lot since then, um, but it's kind of interesting and indicative anyway. Um, so, this is the initial results of the pre-survey. Um, so what I've, I've plotted on each one is box plots for um, the student cohort and their responses on the confidence scale, the interest scale, and the usefulness scale. Um, I guess there are, you know, the, an asterisk, sorry, if there's a significant difference between the male students and the female students. Um, you know, I was actually surprised to see that they started out relatively confident because I kind of had this impression that they they wouldn't. So that was kind of nice. Um, the, you know, the interest was widely ranging and you know, most of them thought oh, it might be a bit useful maybe. Um, there were some gender differences on confidence and interest, but they're, they're relatively small differences. Um, so if I lump them all in together, this is kind of the full co cohort pre-survey state. So kind of, marginally positive on everything. Um, and this is the post survey, uh, the, the kind of end of the, or towards the end of the su subject survey state. Um, on aggregate, everything drops a little bit. The only significant change was in the usefulness, which is a little bit disappointing that they actually came away thinking it was less useful than they thought beforehand. Um, but it's, it's not all bad news. So we also looked at things on kind of a more distribution uh, to kind of look at where things are going. And, you know, I've, I'm talking to a room full of statisticians and I'm not a statistician, so it's probably not um, the best way to analyze the data. But um, what we found, so again, I've separated it to male and female students, is that in the interest state, we moved to having, to some extent, more students that sort of towards the strongly negative or strongly positive um, tails like that that's a bit of a broad statement it's not exactly true but what's interesting is that the the men the male students tend to move down a bit um whereas with the women it tends to kind of distribute a little bit more and you know we do see a bigger chunk in this more positive state but also a bigger chunk in this more negative state and that's something that i think would be worth exploring but we haven't really um gotten to uh, i think part of it is just that they're they're more aware of what these words actually mean and some like it and some don't. Um, the confidence change was also pretty interesting. So it's it's a pretty mixed bag amongst the men. I mean, they start out kind of posit neutrally positive uh, to positive and kind of move in both directions. Um, not too many move down to the fully negative area, which is nice. Uh, the women tend to be a little bit different. So there is a little bit of movement around here, but really they they tend to move to a more confident state. And that at least I think is quite a, a positive result. Um, like I say, I'd be quite keen to, to actually get into this and use the full years of data that I've got. So there's a lot more work to be done. I also have these data de-identified linked to their quiz results, which I think could also be useful in piecing apart some of the um, confidence questions here and whether the movements and confidence are, uh, I guess, reflected in their results. So are they getting less confident because they're not doing as well as they thought they were? Or is it a bit of, oh, this was hard. I didn't realize it would be this hard, but they're actually doing quite well and they haven't quite linked those two things together. So there's a lot a lot to explore. I just need to find the time <laughs> to do that one. Um, 
Great. And then the last thing I wanted to do is just kind of go through in a big picture way kind of what I would suggest to or I guess what our lessons learned have been over the six-ish years that we've been doing this now and what I might suggest for anyone who's looking to do something similar. Um, so I think the first real takeaway for me was that, you know, the students really do develop proficiency. Like it is, when you take a step back, it's really remarkable sometimes um, what some of these students, especially the ones who struggle the most, uh, kind of where they start and where they end up. Um, but they do find this process uncomfortable and it's, you know, it's different from the environment that they're in in high school. Uh, we, have, we have some mature students, but most of our students are coming straight from high school. Um, and they, they do find that process uncomfortable. And so I guess some of our tips have been, or, you know, the ways we've done this now is that it's been really critical to develop this supportive environment for the students to kind of, like I say, fail forward and giving them those opportunities to have assessments that don't really count for anything. And being there in the room with them, talking them through it, you know, talking them, talking them down when they say it's too hard and that they, you know, they don't know what to do and they can't do it. Um, so one thing that we do now, uh, and this is definitely a lesson that I've learned over time, is, is set their expectations from the start. So I go in in week two and I say, this is the trajectory of how most people feel about this subject. We're gonna start here. We're going to go down. It's going to be hard. You're going to think, why am I doing this? I'm really bad at this. And then we go back up. And, um, you know, and I remind them of that throughout. And we actually do, I can't remember if I've got a bullet point on this, but we actually do in one of our lectures, we watch a video on the learning pit and get them to think about that process of things that they've learned before, like an instrument or a, you know, a um, language or something that it's been hard and you know you get really stuck and then you move out and we do some brainstorming around the learning pit and then we keep bringing that concept up so anytime that they're struggling we say yeah we're in the learning pit at the moment you know this is where we're going with it um oh there we go that's my second dot point so we kind of we're kind of throughout teaching them this process of deep learning and that you know the learning that they've sometimes done where it's just been okay i learned it and it was easy isn't always the kind of deep learning that they need to do in university. So it's kind of that kind of becomes part of our course learning goals, really. Um, we make it safe to get things wrong. So that's, again, the, you know, not having marked assessments and getting them to try stuff and helping, you know, showing them our own um, process sometimes. So um, when they get a, a bug, you know, kind of going through the thought process of, huh, I wonder what this error message means. Like, well, here's here's what I, you know, would do. Oh, I don't actually know what that is. And getting them to think about the fact that we don't know all the answers either, but it's really more about the process. Um, and yes, some students need more time than others. I mean, I think that's true in any learning environment. Uh, I find it really, there's a real wide range in um, this kind of stuff. So we kind of make, we, we try to enable that. So we, you know, we let students leave early if they finish stuff up early, um, but we encourage them to just help their peers if they can. But then we also have some things like help sessions that are run outside of the class. So if they want that little bit of extra time, we've been doing them on Zoom. So, you know, it's pretty low um, maintenance for us. We have peer groups for them um, so they can talk to each other. We've used WebEx teams pretty successfully, at least the last few years um, when we were in lockdown to kind of have peer support. But then we had a whole a whole cohort WebEx space where they could just ask each other questions and say, hey, can somebody look at this? And, you know, I can't figure out what's going wrong. So we try to just give them that space. Um, and we try to remind them a lot about what they've accomplished. And especially when we go into those final presentations, you know, we take a moment <laughs> to go back to thinking about where we were in weeks two and three and four, and then paying attention to all the cool things that their peers have come up with. Um, and yeah, I think I mentioned this as well, he's showing our own process of, of not knowing the answers immediately. And, and that actually becomes really hard when you're teaching repeat classes because you see the you see the same mistake over and over. So by week, by repeat number four of the, the week, you can almost guarantee what's gonna have gone wrong, but just kind of taking that time to step back and talk through how to go about figuring out what went wrong, what we might try. Um, I actually, at, at this point, because I've taught this for a long time, I make a point of not reading the prax before I go into class so that everything is unf as unfamiliar to me as it can be. And uh, when I have the more experienced demonstrators, I try to get them to do that as well. Um, and then, you know, I, I guess my one of my key points here is um, trying not to overly dumb down the material, which is really tempting. Uh, there's a difference between kind of paring it back to what you need you need the students to know, but not 
making it overly easy. And I've had a lot of conversations with people where they've said, oh, you know, it was just too hard. So we kind of took these things out. And what I've found is, you know, sharing with the students our high expectations for them, but then really, you know, saying they can do it and supporting them. And it does take a lot of work, but supporting them and getting there has been a really positive experience for the teaching staff and for the students because it, and I, I will say the first year I did this when I was, you know, new to it and overly ambitious, it did not feel like it was going to be that in the middle of the semester. I was pretty sure we were just going to have to can this class and start and do something different. Um, but really seeing them rise to those expectations with that support is probably the most rewarding teaching experience that I've had. Um, I guess on kind of more uh, logistical notes, um, giving students useful incentives to come prepared has been um, something we've brought in over time. And I think that really comes down to the fact that, you know, our students are so busy, like they're working part time jobs, they, they've got caring responsibilities, they've got commuting, like they, they need that structure actually to help them find the time to prioritize these things. And so it's not about bad intentions or laziness. It's really structure is kind of the way that we can fit this into their lives. And it does mean a little bit more coordination work for us, but it's been quite valuable for them in terms of getting those opportunities. So you know, providing structured opportunities for review. For us, that's post lab quizzes, but there might be other ways that you could do that. Um, it's been important for us to ensure that this, the review process is a low hurdle and not a barrier. So we don't want to give them something else to stress about. That's why we make the quizzes, you know, they can repeat them a lot. But even if there are other kind of reflective activities or group activities, you know, something that's going to be enough incentive that they do it, um, but not so much that it's going to scare them <laughs> away. Um, and again, you know, setting those expectations early and continuing to reinforce them. So we, we do have mandatory attendance at our practice because we find that the students get much better support there than if they try to do it at home. When they don't show up, we send them emails, you know, we tell them that they have to do the review quiz and we, we give them lots of opportunities to, you know, fix it if they messed up sort of thing, but kind of continuing to tell them that they need to be there and that this is what's going to happen. And we find that that most of the time, you know, the, the work we have to do on that side drops off over after the first couple of weeks when they just know that they come to class and they come to class with their review quiz done. Um, and then this one, I guess, was not something I'd necessarily foreseen, but the students really do value creativity and they learn so much in the process when they get to have that creativity. Uh, it's a little bit of a shock for them, again, coming out of high school, um, you know, completely open-ended projects is, is feels to them like a rarity. And there's a lot of like questions about is this project good enough wait are you sure that like I don't have to there's no rules like I can do whatever I want um but they really do strive thrive in this situation and it is so fun for us to see what they come up with um and yeah if you're completely open to the student ideas they will surprise you the first year I did this I had a list of project topics that I had in my back pocket so that when the students said I don't know what to do I could use them I, I have never had to use anything from that list like they've always come up with something and some of them have just been so much more creative than anything I would have come up with um you know we decided it was important to um avoid the temptation of judging students on how creative or how complex their idea is because that's not really the learning outcomes here the learning outcome is being able to in our case you know, make a make a code change in a model that's going to help them answer a question. So for some groups, that will be something that's really quite mundane or something that five other groups are doing. And for other groups, it will be like sort of out of this world. And it doesn't matter. It doesn't matter if it's two lines of code that they change or if they completely rewrite the whole thing. It's really about that process. Um, one thing that we have learned over time is that, you know, without stifling their creativity, it's helpful in these open-ended environments to give them a help them get to a minimum viable outcome that they can then build from. Uh, some groups are extremely ambitious. And so one of the things that we've done to kind of help with this is we ask them for a little set of dot points proposal um, in the first week that they meet as a group. Uh, they don't get marked on that, but I read them quickly or you know, whoever's teaching reads them quickly at the start of class and has a chat and if they're promising the world, we get them to narrow down what the first thing they're going to do is that's going to get them to an outcome. And then if that works well, they can build from there. Um, and yeah, you have to be pretty comfortable in these environments, just learning new things yourself and helping them kind of get through it and showing them the learning process, because it's when it's that open ended, you know, you really don't know what they're going to come up with. You don't know the right way, right way around things. But that's where some of those great learning conversations really happen. Um, and I guess the last one, and then I'll, I'll close here so we can have 
some time for discussion. But the last one is really that, you know, it's great when we do these introductions in first year curriculum, but the students would really benefit from ongoing application of their new skills. And I would say that, you know, thinking about this in the whole of course program way is good. It's a place that we're still trying to figure out in our, um, our degrees and our curriculum's changed a few times. So, you know, we do have R and some Python in some other spaces, um, but there are still challenges there. And I guess some of the things we're grappling with, you know, are well, the kind of obvious, I guess, where can they practice and grow this expertise in second and third year subjects? So again, trying to build it into existing spaces, which is hard because these spaces are already full. So that's that's one challenge. Um, how do we cater to students who miss out on this kind of fairly intensive background? So a lot of our, most of our subjects don't have prereqs and they can take them as electives. So, you know, are there ways we can package up the fundamentals that they can kind of do on their own or what do you repeat? That's, I think, been a big challenge for us still. Um, when and how do we introduce other languages? So I think right now what we have is, is pretty ad hoc. You know, some people are teaching R because they teach R and they use R and the package that they need to use is in R and that's great. I don't think that we've really done a, a careful thinking about are there more structured ways that we could teach them to swap from one language to another um, and that's kind of a space that we can still explore in future um, and then I think one thing I would like to see is kind of building this into our capstone so again if you have a whole of course approach you're starting in the first year with the basics you're building it in in those second and third year subjects but then you're finding a space for it in a capstone even if your capstone like ours tend to be kind of field or lab based um, so I think that's everything I wanted to say. Hopefully we've got a bit of time for questions and I would like to just thank all of the many people who have contributed in various ways to the subject. Um, and I'm not even teaching it this semester. So thanks to all the teaching staff who are taking it on now. And of course, all of the students and um, yeah, happy to take any questions.